Growing a greener world is made possible in part by the 2019 Subaru Crosstrek. Built in a zero landfill plant, so you can roam the earth with a lighter footprint. Subaru, proud sponsor of Growing a Greener World. I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. last visited Dr. Lee Rice in his farmden, we spent most of that episode learning how to create and maintain a weedless garden. But Lee has a lot of interest besides just creating a vegetable garden that's nearly free of all the weeds. He's an expert pruner and he's written a book about that. And he has a real passion for growing fruit. And I'm not just talking about mainstream fruit like the incredible blueberries that he grows, but uncommon fruit. And I'm not talking about fruit that's either hard to find or hard to grow, but fruit that's underappreciated in the home garden. And it's no surprise Lee's growing a lot of uncommon fruit right here. So today we're back to talk to Lee to learn more about uncommon fruit and why we should be growing more of it in our own home gardens. And Lee, I also love walking through your farmdom, right? Right, farmden. Farmed in. Too big for a garden, too small for a farm? Is that or the right more than it More than a garden, less than a farm. <laughs> okay. Author, lecturer, columnist, blogger, horticulturalist, soil scientist, and one of the most recognized and respected plant minds alive, with fans and followers around the world. If there were a Mount Rushmore of true garden masters, Lee Reich would be on it. So it was a real treat to hang out with him at his home about 90 miles north of New York City. I got an up-close look at one of his passions, uncommon fruit varieties, that he says not nearly enough of us regular gardeners are growing. You know, Lee, I always love to come and visit you and your garden, of course, because not only do I get to have some good conversation with you, but I get to see some great plants and eat some amazing fruit like these black raspberries, right? Yeah, they're sometimes called black caps. Mm -hmm. They grow wild pretty much everywhere around here and, you know, east, in the east. Uh, but most people don't grow them. I like to grow them because get a lot bigger crop. And they're delicious. Yeah. Here's your gateway plant, the figs and the containers. Yeah, so fig was the first plant I ever planted when I got into agriculture. And I still grow some in containers. And these are different varieties I'm growing just to, um, I want to see what they taste like. Mm -hmm. And if they taste good, they go to the big house. This big house. Right. In the winter, I have vegetables in here. Uh-huh. But this time of year, I have figs. And these are grown as espaliers, right? And that's uh, and which makes it very easy to prune, and they get a lot of light. Uh huh. Good air circulation, very easy to pick. So uh, the whole plant basically is just a trunk, one stem, permanent stem, and all these are just temporary because every year at the end of the season, I cut them back so they don't shade uh, and they're so, so they don't shade the vegetables in the winter. And this is new growth. One of the great things about figs, you get fruit off of new growth. Right, one of, the few, one of the few fruits that will fruit on new growth, which has two benefits. One is you can cut it back like that, but the other benefit is that uh, they keep bearing. So like this fig's bigger than this fig, so as it grows, it just keeps bearing figs. When you pick these, you just need to eat them, right? Right. They don't keep very well. Right. They don't ripen once you pick them, and they don't taste good unless they are dead ripe, and then they don't travel at all. all right. so, uh, you know, but I do, so I'm going to come back here in a couple <laughs> weeks when these are ready to harvest. Towards the end of uh, end of uh, August, or sometimes earlier, but we sometimes we come out every day with that many figs. It's just, you know, it's hard to eat them all. More for it's me. A, it's a job, but somebody's got to do it. <laughs> I got interested in growing fruit 
mostly I have to say because I like to eat fruit. I mean, from, from the time I was very young, we did have a few fruit, fruit trees in my house, but uh, we just, my family, we eat a lot of fruit. It's, it's definitely something that we all like. When I switched into agriculture, originally, uh, from something totally different. I was in chemistry and I switched into agriculture. I, it's not like I went into, I want to learn about growing fruit. I just was interested in gardening. And then uh, I guess when I took a class in pomology, which is fruit growing, I guess that reawakened that, that early love of fruit and I think this, this is what I need. The first fruit that I became interested in uh, growing was a fig for some reason, which is especially odd since I was living in Madison, Wisconsin, where temperatures always got down to 25 or 30 below zero. So I bought a fig tree, and I lived in an apartment, not with a sunny window, and I bought a pot, maybe a 12-inch flower pot, I don't know what kind of potting soil I made or bought, and I stuck the fig tree in there. It did grow, but of course it never fruited because it didn't have sun or any of the other conditions that a fig tree would like. But that was my first fruit. That first experiment eventually led to Lee's Farmden, a two plus acre test orchard of sorts where Lee grows what he likes and hopes that he can teach others about fruits that go beyond the basics at the supermarket. This is what, black currant? This is European black currant, Ribes nigrum. You love this one, don't you? Yeah, this is, this is one of my two favorite mm -hmm. fruits, the other being blueberry. And uh, the nice thing about it is it's a plant that tolerates shade, yeah. so that's why I have it in, in between these uh, pawpaw trees. Right. And uh, it's uh, super high in vitamin C. And uh, deer don't particularly like it, so it's deer resistant, not deer proof. Okay, that's a good one. That's a plus, especially and, with fruit. And the other thing is I really love the taste of it. Sweet tart, but to me, it's resiny. So maybe not a positive for you? No, that's a really positive. That's a good thing? I love this thing, this fruit. You, gotta, you have a descriptor? Different. That's a different kind right. of taste. So, so a lot of people don't like them. I have to admit, fresh. But everybody likes them uh, as juice, as as jam. The the uh, drink cassis is made with uh, with black currants. And this is very high in vitamin C. Yeah, very yes. high in vitamin C. Kind of makes oranges or you know orange juice not so potent compared right. to this. Right. Oranges. Orange juice is like water compared to this vitamin C wise. White currant, right? Right, this is a different kind of currant, white currant, which is a different species, same genus, but has a lot of the same benefits uh, as far as deer resistant, tolerate shade, that's why it's grown in between these trees, and uh, easy to grow. Basically, these are very pest free. I have to admit, it's not my favorite fruit. They're pretty tart. I was about. Interesting that, that uh, <laughs> young kids, when they come here, they love this. <laughs> you think kids would only like sweet stuff, but. Uh, it's like that sour candy. It's interesting how different it is from the black to the white. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally different flavor. And uh, this, even though it's tart, it's not high in vitamin C. But it makes a really good jelly or, you know, meat sauce, whatever. You know, I'm not a good cook with fruit, so I don't know. But you're a good grower right. of them. Right. It started out along my driveway, I had, as many people do. I had a row of forsythia bushes. And in spring, it was great. You know, it was just a, this glowing yellow. It was like warmth emanating from it. And then, uh, but after that, you know, it's sort of a green blob, maybe, uh, maybe you notice it, maybe you don't, but it, it's not ugly, but it's not pretty. So I, so I ripped those out. I had been researching and I was somewhat familiar with a plant called Nanking cherry, planted a row of Nanking cherries. Nice thing about, about the same time that Forsythia would have been in bloom, Nanking cherries come into bloom and they're just awash in white, pinkish white blossoms. So much so people on the street would often stop and ask, what is that plant in bloom? And then after that, you know, a month or two after bloom, or two months after bloom, there's just cherries all over the place that I could just walk down my driveway and eat these cherries. It's one of my favorite plants. And, and it's a very tough plant. It comes from the hills of Manchuria, where temperatures in winter are minus 50. In summer, they're plus 110. So, you know, that was a great plant. And that, that's what, one thing that got me started. And then I went on to many other fruits. I grow a lot of kiwi fruits. I see that. Uh, what I grow is uh, hardy kiwi fruits. Mm -hmm. There's a few species that are edible. This is one of them. So this is Actinida colomicta. So this species is nice because it's, uh, first of all, it's not overly vigorous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need pruning every year. Or actually, you don't have to prune it, but be, it's better for fruiting if you prune it. The other species is this one up here, 
which is Actinidia arguta, which is different from the other one. You can see the leaves look different, but very decorative. Actually, and it's the, a lot bigger too. Yeah, and it's super vigorous. So you have to you have to prune this, or it'll take over your house. Right. And uh, and these ripen in uh, early late summer. Mm -hmm. On the outside, you can see it's smaller yep. than uh, the market kiwi, right. the fuzzy kiwi. It has a smooth skin, so you just pop them in your mouth. And inside, it looks just like the market kiwi, and uh, the flavor. Most people agree, and I surely say much better. Nice. It's uh, sweeter and more aromatic. So uh, it's a great tasting fruit. The one thing about both species is you have separate male and female plants. So you need one male to pollinate up to eight females. Very important. This is a fruit that was introduced into this country as an ornamental, okay. and people grew it for decades just as an ornamental. You know, the fruit isn't, it's green when it's ripe, so people didn't realize, kind of, they, they didn't see the fruit, right. basically. So you got the best of both worlds. Yeah. I like that. Most of the common fruits have been, uh, well, they've been selected for good uh, marketability. You know, that you can pick them, you know, apples are, Apples have a lot going for them. They can, you can pick them, you can store them. They ship pretty well. A uh, fruit breeder at Cornell, when I worked for Cornell, he bemoaned the fact that, because uh, he had bred an apple, John Gold, which at that time, now, now it does pretty well, but at that time people didn't buy it because it wasn't a red apple. It was yellow, splashed with some red. And he said, he really bemoaned the fact, he said Americans eat with their eyes. <sighs> the like American persimmon, pawpaw, uh, mulberries, all these fruits, they're very easy to grow, but uh, very hard to handle. And also, they, a certain look, you know, apples, you, they can be, they're bred actually, to, to have this nice bright red look, which is, that appeals to us. Whereas, you know, a pawpaw, I have to say, is not that attractive a fruit. It looks sort of like a fruit that, you know, it's green with some black splotch, splotches on it. Um, but, you know, once you eat it, it's, if it's about flavor, Lee, I've got a lot of catching up to do if I want to grow as many varieties of fruit as you were growing, but I am growing pawpaw and I'm loving it. They are very popular these days. Yeah, it's an interesting fruit. It has a lot of tropical aspirations. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, it's the northernmost member of the custard apple family. Yep. Which some people may be familiar with. Yeah. It also has this very tropical looking leaves. Very tropical, and yet this grows way north, right? Way north. This has survived below minus 30 at my house. <laughs> That's crazy. And then the, the fruit grows in clusters like bananas. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, the fruit has a, a flavor very similar to banana. Matter of fact, it's sometimes been called the New York banana, the Hoosier banana, the Michigan banana, any state that happens <laughs> to grow in banana. Claims it. Or sometimes I like to think of it as creme brulee without the fat and cream. And it's nice and ornamental, and yet I noticed that you have top these, but even in the mature state, they only get about, what, 25? 25, 25 feet, feet high. But yeah, that, that's because I collect them from the ground, let them ripen totally on the tree, drop, and then uh, over a certain height, they will splatter. Oh, okay, that's a smart technique. Now, Lee, when it comes to uncommon fruit, blueberries don't fall into that category, but what is uncommon? is this place right here. What do you call this? This the blueberry? is the, the Blueberry Temple. This is only, <laughs> only anointed ones are allowed in here. So, <laughs> well, I am honored. So thank welcome. You, thank you very much. <laughs> so the area is about 25 by 30 feet, 16 plants, almost 200 quarts of blueberries. Oh, <laughs> per year? Yeah. That is incredible. Just 16 We eat months? about half of those and freeze the other half. So blueberries basically are very easy to take care of. Mm -hmm. uh, they have very few pest problems. It's a Native American fruit. But the, the one thing that's very important for blueberries is uh, soil. Yeah. And it's easy to get the soil right. You just have to do it. So basically, basically they like a soil that's very acidic, very high in organic matter, uh -huh. and consistently moist, and, and but well aerated, which the organic matter does. Right. So as far as the soil pH, we're talking like 4.0 to 4.5. That's like well, super low. 4 to 5.5. Okay. Yeah, it's still super low. But way lower than what yeah, we would consider right. neutral. Most plants would not like that. Yeah. So, uh, and, and it's easy to do. You know, a lot of places don't have soil that acidic, and you just add elemental sulfur, which is a naturally mined mineral. Mm -hmm. You add that to the soil in the right amount, and it lowers the acidity. And over the years, you might have to re reapply it, but it's not not that big a thing. But you don't recommend that people try to lower that pH with uh, pine shavings or pine needles or peat moss, right? They can try if they want, but it won't do anything. Because why? Because any organic matter, when you add it to the soil, what does it drops the pH, but then over time the pH goes up to neutral. 
okay. or seven. Yeah. So really the only way to do it, and that's why, and you can tell from the leaves, a lot of people grow blueberries and they'll get this uh, sort of yellowing of the leaves. Mm -hmm. And you can see these are nice and green. Yeah. And that's, that, that's an indication of uh, correct pH. Well, you also recommend with some when somebody wants to venture into growing fruit in their backyards to maybe start with berries. So I assume that we're talking low pest and disease pressure with blueberries. Yeah, for I most. mean blueberries is one fruit that I've never not gotten a full crop. And the other thing we didn't mention is that they're really pretty plants. I mean, you can see the way that you know people grow a lot of ornamentals like ornamental crab apples, cherries, and if you look at the the foliage this time of year, it's not that pretty. Right. Plant. But look at this. This is like totally healthy, green, lush. And then in spring, you get these nice white flowers. Yes. And fall, the My favorite time. Fall, the colors unbelievable on these. It's Fire like, red. Yeah. It's yeah. really, uh, really nice. And even in winter, the stems on some varieties, especially to, if, when it gets cold, turn red. Yeah. So uh, it's a plant that's got everything, and except for pests. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like my kind of plant. Yeah. While much of what's growing at Lee's Farmden is uncommon, and his results are certainly extraordinary, it all comes down to the basics, giving the plants what they need to thrive. It almost always starts with soil structure, and it's not as hard as you think. All right, Mr. King of Compost, I know you got a lot of talents and this is one of your highest ones. Talk to me about your secrets for making incredible compost. The main secret, number one secret, a bin. A bin. And uh, this happens to be, I have to say, this is, this, to me, is state-of-the-art bin. <laughs> okay. And uh, basically it's made out of uh, artificial wood deck, manufactured wood decking, and so it won't rot away and you can see they're notched, fits together like ligand and logs. And yeah. It's really nice because when you, when you build it, it gets higher and higher. Mm -hmm. And then when you start taking the compost out, you don't have to reach down. It gets lower and lower. It keeps a lot of the heat in, keeps moisture in, keeps some scavengers out. This is it. Now, are you got the guy that comes in here and turns it all the time or do you just let it cook? No, I don't turn it all the time. I basically, I build it through the summer mm -hmm. into fall. Yeah. I mean, I build many piles, right, but I do. build them all summer long into fall, and then uh, next spring, I turn them once, and I, it gives me an opportunity to look at it. Maybe they need water, maybe it needs to be uh, mixed up a little better, and also I can see how far gone it is, right. and I write that down, and then during the summer, but surely that fall, I use it. But a closer look at Lee's compost pile uncovers some techniques that range from the uniquely uncommon to the downright weird. And then well, what about watering? What's your system for that? So every few layers, what I do is I have this little contraption here. It's called a Benditron. <laughs> uh, no, Watertron. Oh, Watertron. And uh, basically here's a, a pressure reducer, like from a drip irrigation system, a valve, and then a sprinkler yep. with a little... Uh, steak steak to put it in and put this right here uh, this is basically equipment from a drip irrigation kit yeah except for the sprinkler so what i do is and then i so i'll have a few layers that need watering and then i can go to another pile where i turn on this water mm -hmm. which i have it set for to go about this big and i leave it for 20 minutes and, and that's that it's done now lee you know there are certain rules that aren't always followed as far as what you can and can't compost. And you're the guy, I don't think there's anything you don't compost. And you've right. got some samples of some crazy <laughs> things, right? Yeah, well, well, one thing is because I have a respect for the soil. And if the alternative is to bury something in the soil, I would always rather compost it. All right, so <laughs> I don't think you're they holding that smell anymore. But right, this, this, uh, these are actually leather shoes that uh, I guess there's a lot of non-leather in here. But anyway, all the leather's gone. It was composted. And I think this one might be my favorite. The only thing I can identify on here is a zipper. What is this? These were a pair of uh, uh, designer-ish jeans <laughs> that my uh, daughter had. Uh, and then she was finished with them. So I guess the pockets are really tough. You can keep that in mind when you use the pockets. Now is this just an experiment for you or you, do you truly say, I'm gonna compost this Well, at stuff? first it was sort of a joke, but now it's like, what am I gonna do, put it in the landfill? So you really compost cotton. this? Yeah. Yeah, if, actually if we dug down here, I had some shorts. Everything goes in the Everything compost. Everything here. As long as you get it high enough and cook it long yeah. enough. Yeah, time and or temperature. Okay. Plus the price is right, because right. everything in here is free. <laughs> right. I love it. Yeah. People talk about the greens and the browns yep. and the ratio to use, but it's, it's not really all that important. 
uh, because first of all, you can't compute it exactly. Right. And also, any pile of, organ of organic material, when you pile it up, eventually it will become compost. Yes. So that's it, just make just compost. Like, just like yeah. in nature. Yeah. And nature is always on full display in this fertile region of the country. I'm struck by it every time I come to New England, and this part of New York in particular. So while visiting Lee, I couldn't help but pay a visit to the iconic Mohonk Mountain House, just a few miles away. Uh, we're about 90 miles north of New York City right now, and um, so it's a very short trip for you know, one of the largest metropolitan areas of our country. Um, the original settlers came up here to cut poles for um, ships, back, shipbuilders back in England, um, but it was kind of that growth out of New York City and we're just off the Hudson River. Um, everybody's heard of West Point. They've heard of Rip Van Winkle. They've heard of um, the Culinary Institute of America, and these are all institutions in a, right in our backyard. Mohonk is steeped in history. Five U.S. presidents have stayed here. Movies have been shot here. It's won multiple travel awards, appeared on numerous best of lists, and it's listed as a National Historic Landmark on the Register of Historic Places. The resort itself sits on 1,200 acres. Um, we were originally founded in 1869, so we're 150 years old this year. And uh, one of our major attractions is our gardens. The show garden, which we're standing in today, uh, is actually built on five acres of rock. Uh, Topsoil was trucked in, and this was back in 18, late 1860s, early 1870s. Uh, to build up a garden on top of a mountain. Um, it's kind of an odd place to build one, but it, the resort needed one. We serve, and in the peak of the season, we'll serve over 2,000 meals a day. Um, and we source as much of that food as we can locally through local farmers and through a farm cooperative. Um, historically, we had seven farms on the property where we would actually produce the food, um, both meats and vegetables. In a typical year, we compost approximately 190 tons of raw material, uh, which will produce about 125 yards of finished compost. The majority of it goes into the gardens, um, top dressing on the grounds and top dressing on the golf course. Um, a portion of it also ends up in our greenhouse uh, for potting mix. So it's such a great growing community. Uh, there's plenty of opportunities to partner with local farmers. Uh, we want to support those local businesses. Um, our focus is really on hospitality, so that's what we want to be able to focus on and um, work with those partners to source what we need in season. Maybe it's no coincidence, really, that this part of the country gave birth to Lee Reich's amazing farmden and all his uncommon fruits. So the reason these fruits are uncommon is because a lot of fruit are treated as commodities, you know, like apples, just red orbs, and, and it's really not about the specific flavors, you know, beyond a few flavors, but you know, there's 5,000 varieties of apple. And people are most familiar with what they see in the supermarket. So, you know, you see the usual apples, peaches, cherries, plums, and uh, these other fruits uh, just, just don't make it and there are reasons. Some of them don't ship so well, so some of them are really good backyard fruits, but you'll never see them in a supermarket. For instance, I grow American persimmons, which when they're ready to eat, they're, they're, just, they're about this big and they're super soft, and you, you can't handle them commercially, but uh, on a backyard, you know, it doesn't matter how soft they are, you just pick them and eat them. Well, I hope that today's episode inspired you to try growing some uncommon fruit in your own home garden, just like Lee is growing right here. And if you'd like to watch this episode again or learn more about growing uncommon fruit, we have that information on our website under the show notes for this episode. And the website address, that's the same as our show name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm Joe Lample, and I'll see you again here next time for more Growing a Greener World.
Now you can continue your garden learning online in courses from me, Joe Lample, in my online gardening academy. Classes are designed to teach gardeners of all levels, from the fundamentals to master skills. Explore the courses available right now, plus new topics covering everything you need to know to grow like a pro. Take each class on your own schedule, from anywhere. Plus, you'll have opportunities to ask me questions about your specific garden in real time. Go to joegardner.com learn for details today.